Yes, we do. Perfect. So I just say good morning to everyone that's um, online with us today and a hello to anyone that's going to be watching after the webinar. Um, I'd like to start today before we get into our webinar um, just with an acknowledgement of country. So um, just acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're presenting from today in Narrabri, which is the Gamilaroi and Camilleroy people, and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, just a little housekeeping for today. If you could have any questions pop up through any of the presentations, just put them in the chat box and we'll cover those at the end of each session. Um, we've got a really exciting lineup of speakers today for what is our third instalment of the DigiFarm Expo webinar series, and we're going to be focus focusing on livestock today. So really pleased to have um, Ron Ison here with me today. We're going to kick off with, with our short presentation, just highlighting what we've been doing with the DigiFarm project in, um, in Narrabri and across the Northwest region as a part of a project with the University of Sydney. So I'll just bring that up and we can get started. So the, the DigiFarm project that we're talking about, we're running in a collaboration with the University of Sydney and it's part of a national land care program that is funded by the Australian Federal Government that we receive some funding for. So it's due to wrap up at the end of um, this financial year. We've been running it for a bit over 12 months now. Throughout our region, we currently have 15 sites that are either active or that have been active that we've been working on. So with livestock, we've currently got three Optiways spread out throughout our Northwest region. As you can see up the top here, um, that's a map of our region. So the current sites where we have them are at Werris Creek, um, Yarry Lake, west of Narrabri and at Bogabri. And we've also had a unit at Malls Creek, which is at Ron's place out at Malls Creek um, and also at Bogabri. We're hoping to continue sending them west out towards Walgett so we can really get them spread across the region. And it's something we're gonna be looking at doing more moving forward. We also, from a livestock perspective, have two walkover weigh units, which are another way to um, measure weights of livestock in paddock. And these are at Warriata and currently on farm at Bogabri as well. I'll just play uh, this little video that I've got here, uh, which we took this when we set up the Optiway out at Ron's place, and it gives you a good snapshot of what the unit is and what we're actually talking about today. So Optiway system is a, a system for weighing cattle in the paddock uh, that doesn't require trapping them or forcing them to walk over something and is, is portable and can be moved from mob to mob very easily. Sorry, guys, I've just had um, I've just had Guy come in and let me know that our screen sharing wasn't working properly. Um, so we'll just scoot back. I'll just show you this map that we had up here. Uh, yep. Sorry about that, folks. So this was the map that I was referring to previously. Um, so you can see up here where it's the map of the Northwest region. So where we were discussing, we've got um, this one here, which was out at Bogabri, was an Optiway. We also have them, um, this is a walkover way up at Lockery's. So if you imagine our region is going around here, there's quite a large spread um, and we're trying to get the units spread out evenly across the region so we can really get into lots of different um, production systems around the region. So we'll try that video again and hopefully we'll have a little bit more luck this time. <laughs> So Optiway system is a, a system for weighing cattle in the paddock uh, that doesn't require trapping them or forcing them to walk over something and is, is portable and can be moved from mob to mob very easily. Quickly. I'm Bill Mitchell, I'm a, I'm a beef farmer from near Armidale in New South Wales and I'm the founder of Optiway. The benefits really fall into three categories and the first one is, is not having to yard the 
cattle to weigh them. So from what we've seen, that, that costs anywhere between 2 and even 10% in, in weight just to do that, and, and that weight's not quickly recovered, if at all. And it also takes a lot of time and, and labour, and for that reason, people aren't able to gather weights as often as they'd like to. So there's a real benefit there. Secondly, it's, a, it's about um, looking at... Try, Really sorry about that, guys. Seem to not be able to get the video to work, so we'll we'll push on. Um, so as we mentioned before, this we've got Ron with us today. We ran put an optiway out at his place to do a demonstration site out there. So as we had it set up, um, we had 127 trade heifers that Ron had bought in. They were cell grazing um, across the eight paddocks. These are 10 to 20 hectares, is that correct? 20, 20 hectares. Yep, 20 yeah. hectares um, paddocks. So they went on rotation. We followed them across two rotations and we took pasture cuts as well so that we could see if we, if we um, how their weight gain was tracking in comparison to the quality of the feed that they were running on. Um, and we had some some quite interesting results. Was there anything else you wanted to add from your, that your place from? Um, no, we, we did this as a CMA project in 2011, and um, I just wanted to um, find out which were the best performing pastures, actually. Yep. So we'll skip across. So this is a, a weight chart that you get when you go into the OptiWay system and what you can see. And so I'll show you on the next slide, but as we were doing our pasture cuts, we were seeing that the pastures were there, a lot of them were subtropical pastures and improved pastures. So they were at their prime with the rainfall and through summer, and we were expecting to see quite good weight gain, um, but the cattle weren't performing as we were expecting them to. And when we went through, you can see where there's these slight drops in average daily gain. I'm hoping you can see my mouse on here. Um, you can see there's these slow dips in average daily gain. And when we went back through Ron's diary, thankfully he keeps very, very good um, records. Each of those drops in average daily gain, we were able to track back to a weather event that occurred. Um, so what we actually picked up from this was we were able to quantify and really see how those um, weather events were impacting. So there was a few big storms with a lot of hail. There were some periods of over a week where it was just drizzly rain and sort of one to five mil, but we really saw the impact that that had on the cattle over that period of time. Um, and something you commented to me about previously, Ron, too, was about the performance of the cattle through summer. They generally didn't tend to do as well. Was, did they, What we saw with the Optio, did that show as much as what you were anticipating? Um, well, yes, we knew that, but we only found that out when we actually sent, sent the cattle either to a feedlot, and when we got our weights back, we found that um, they'd lost weight or hadn't gained weight, um, and also when we killed cattle. So we knew in, in uh, January, February, mainly February, and July were the two uh, parts of the year that we didn't get weight gain. So we knew that, but we, we didn't know that we didn't get weight gain in rainfall events. So the OptiWay picked that up, and also it would have picked up um, the loss in weight in February and July as well. Yeah. And so one thing that um, I found quite interesting too was just how long those, when we have those drizzly overcast days and it's humidity, just how much impact that had on the weight gain of the animals. And as Ron said, when you're looking at booking them in, um, it's really good to be able to see live in the paddy how that's affecting them. So this was from a pasture cut we did in one of the paddocks and you can see sitting at 10.2% crude protein and 7.3 megs of energy, um, we'd expect these trade heifers to be doing anywhere between a kilo and a half to around a kilo a day um, based on that. But the average daily gain that we were actually seeing was closer to um, minus 3.7 kilos. So um, something that we picked up here, I'll just click through to this. We get this report coming through. Um, this is, it comes to your email every day. It's a daily report, which is really handy to receive. And you can see here that it's minus 3.4 kilos for the average daily gain. So you'd see that and alarm bells would be ringing. Um, but when we look here, and this sort of highlighted the importance of looking at your daily report, you can see there's a high of 779 kilos which was out of the range for these heifers. So what we've actually picked up here is what we think is a cycling effect. So a heifer is walking into the unit, her tag scanning and she's getting weighed. Uh, and then another heifer is coming in and riding her. So we're picking up a heifer and a half, which skewed the data a bit, but we still were not seeing the performance when digging into the data a bit more that we thought we should be seeing. 
So just some things from troubleshooting. One of the ideas of getting these units onto farms in the region was to really see how they work, how functional they are, what the return on investment of having them would be. Um, and when Ron first put the unit out, it was a really novel stimulus for the cattle. And so they spent a lot of time, as we discovered in the first period, digging around the unit. And there was quite a big um, indent, which I think you ended up getting the blade out, didn't you, Ron? Yes, yeah, so that. I think they're pushing, trying to get in and pushing others away. Yeah. yeah. And so we had to blade. So that was sort of something as a learning that came out of that was just be careful when you're first introducing them to it about where you're putting it. We have seen this to a bit lesser extent in other herds, but I wouldn't be putting it in the middle of your freshly um, freshly levelled irrigation paddock. Um, Ron, I'll let you talk about the, the lick blocks that go in with the cattle and what you found with them using them. Well, just looking at the, at the um, daily uh, reports, um, we were getting probably 80 or 90 cattle going in each day, and then it dropped back to sort of 15 to 20. And um, so I, I just didn't know why that had happened. So what I actually did, we'd ha we had a molasses block in first, and I thought, well, maybe they're just getting sick of licking the molasses, they want something else. So I, I put a 12% um, sulfur block in, and the next day we were back up to our 70s, 80s and 90s again. So just by looking at uh, the, the report you get each day, you can, you know, you, you look and then you think, well, what have I got to do? What's happening? And um, so, yes, just keep an eye on, on your supplement that you've got in there um, and you might have to change it occasionally. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that daily report was really good because it just comes to email every day. You can just open it up and have a quick look and get a, have a snapshot of what's going on if you need to make any changes. Um, and another thing which was um, sort of highlighted that concept, if you're going to invest in these units, you need to put the time into just looking at the data. Um, we were tracking the cattle and we saw some really big drops towards the end of the project and wasn't quite sure what was going on. So we went out to have a look at the unit um, and we found on the screen that the scales were weighing at minus 18 kilos on the tear weight, which um, it should be at zero. So that was accounting for the, the losses that we were seeing that the cattle didn't seem to be losing that in the paddock. Um, and when we dug down into what was causing that, Ron had moved the unit after some rain and we had some rocks get stuck up near the load bars. Little stones, yeah. Yeah, little stones, which was, which was throwing out the data. Um, so just another thing in terms of a practical sense is just to be keeping an eye on, on the data that's coming through and making sure that if you are having any of these outlier figures jumping out at you, that you're dealing with them. We were able to have that data removed, thankfully, but we lost about 14 days worth of data by having to get that pulled out, which was a bit of a, a bit of a shame to have to do that. I'll just touch on what else we're doing. We currently work, we've got some walkover way systems. We've got two of these units set up in the region as well. These are used really effectively up in Northern Australia, um, generally set up around a turkey's nest on a dam where the cattle walk into water. Um, they walk through their scale set up in there and a tag reader, they walk through, they get weighed and that gets sent through. It's really good for getting a measure on every animal every day. So our question was, how can we use these units in the Northwest? Is there an application for them or is something like the OptiWay um, going to be a more effective uh, unit to use. It's more transportable with our smaller paddock systems and rotationally grazing cattle more. So this unit is set up out at Warriata. We've got a unit at Bogabri as well. Um, and you can see here what we're doing out at the Avendano's property at Bogabri. We've been really fortunate in being able to have an OptiWay and a walkover way system out there. So in terms of our project objective to be able to see how these units work in the region, we've now been able to put them side by side in a paddock with a mob of cattle. So we're really going to be able to evaluate the, pro, the pros and cons and how best we can use these technologies. So hopefully when we're discussing with producers what this technology is, we'll be able to show them um, this may be the best fit for your enterprise for these reasons. Um, so we will be doing some more field days, hopefully um, with COVID middle of the year hopefully so we can get people out on farm to actually have a look at the units and discuss with the producers one-on-one -on -one, um, how, how they've found the units to use. So I've just got a few more questions for Ron. We've got a few more minutes. Um, I'll just check if there's any that have come up. If you've got any chat questions please send them through. Um, so my first question for Ron was, what were your first thoughts and expectations on the technology when we came to you about running the demonstration site? And where did you see the application and why did you say yes to the project? Well, first of all, um, because I had it in cells, um, I thought it would be quite easy to manage it there. 
Um, I didn't have a lot of expectations because I hadn't uh, seen one before, but after it had been there for a couple of days and I was getting the feedback, then I started to think, well, we can do this and we can do that. And, and the main thing I wanted to do was find it the best paddocks and the best performing uh, cells. And we did find in the end that I just don't have enough um, uh, loosen or um, uh, yeah, nitrogen in the grasses. So um, that was one thing we found out about it. And um, the other thing was the weather events. Um, that was an eye opener. Yeah. Um, and can you talk a bit about, we had the conversation when you got onto your agent when it was time to sell them about the extra information you were to, able to provide to him when looking at booking the cattle and making that final decision to sell the cattle? Yes, well, when we made the, uh, the final decision, or we were making the final decision, um, and I was talking to my agent and he said, well, you know, one of the average weights. And so I just went into my last reading and said, well, the minimum weight is such and such, maximum is such and such and the average is that. So um, when we actually killed the cattle, the average weight was spot on. So I've got no qualms about the accuracy of the, of the OptiWay. Yeah, really, really good correlation and that decision making being able to know exactly what you had in the paddock without having to we run didn't, them We up. didn't have to muscle them and draft them and weigh them. We just, I just took them off last report. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so can you talk a bit about the functionality from your perspective, so in terms of getting the unit set up, the ease of use, moving it around the paddock with the cattle because you do move them frequently. Um, how did you find that? Well, I was, I was moving them every Sunday. I was giving them a week in each paddock. Uh, so because of the, the cells are so close together, it wasn't, it wasn't an issue. But one thing I did find, which made it a lot easier, at one stage... Um, we found that as the cattle grew, they were actually um, step, weren't stepping on the plate. They were reaching the supplement without stepping on the plate. So Optiway did send me a plate when they delivered the thing, a set, uh, that I, an extra one I put on so they uh, would stand on it. That made it a little bit heavier, but it didn't worry me too much. But then um, the university actually borrowed it for a field day and we loaded it on the uh, the uh, ute with the uh, forks on the front of the tractor. And I thought, gee, this is an easy way to move it. So because the cells were so close together, I used to just run in with the forks, pick it up and put it in the next paddock. Yeah. Yeah, other than the, that bit of an issue with the wet weather and the mud getting under it, that, um, yeah, well, it was, it was yeah. quite simple to use that. Yes, oh, yes. So, um, very simple. Yeah, so my only other question is, um, I touched on some of the troubleshooting problems that we encountered and that um, we picked up with the project, but was there anything else that you would add or that you found difficult or challenging in terms of managing the unit and the cattle? Um, with, with all the wet weather, it was quite interesting a few times backing the side-by-side -side up to uh, hook it on the back drawbar. Yep. So um, that was one problem. You just had to tow it out of the, out of the water a bit to um, hook it up. But um, after I realised I could pick it up with the front, front end loader, um, that fixed that problem. Yeah, but that was the only issue. When it, when it was rainy and it was wet and boggy, um, I did have a bit of trouble a couple of times getting back to it. Yeah. And so my, my last question for you, Ron, would be, would you recommend this to producers um, that are looking for a way to better manage and track the performance of their cattle on pastures? And is it something you'd look to use in the future? Well, I definitely would recommend it. Um, but what I would say is um, have, a bit, have a plan before you bought, buy one knowing what, what you actually want to get out of it. Um, it's horses for courses, but um, uh, if you're going to book cattle in to, a, to an abattoir or to a feedlot, um, just have a look at the weather forecast before you do it and um, make the adjustments because you, you, will not have, you won't have a weight gain on those wet days. Um, and the other thing is that um, it's going to be interesting when I analyse the pastures because I already know that I've, I've got to put more legumes into my grasses. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming in today, Ron. No um, worries, huh? We are going to have some case studies coming out soon with more information on these projects. Um, so keep an eye out on those and they'll be available on our website.
having an issue with this. So I'm just going to pass on now. Up next, we've got um, Rosie O'Reilly from Lampro. So Rosie grew up on a sheep and cattle enterprise in southern New South Wales and completed a Bachelor of Animal Science up at the University of New England in 2014. Uh, she then went on to work in the feedlot industry for two years and now works for Lampro, which is Australia, Australia's largest prime lamb seed stock business. And she's been there for five for the past five years um, with the current role as operations manager. So part of that role involves managing the database for 10,000 performance recorded stud use um, and coordinating staff and the day-to-day -day activities of running the business, uh, as well as providing client services. Lampro provides genetics to over 340 lamb producing businesses around the country. And in 2021, those clients produced over 1 million lamb. So a really big enterprise. Um, and we're going to hear from Rosie today about how they use technology and cheap EID within their business um, and with their clients. So I'll just pass over to Rosie now if you want to share your screen. Thanks, Naomi. Right, I hope I don't bore you too much <laughs> with all the sheep chat. But yeah, as Naomi touched on, um, I thought I'd just start with a bit of a background on Lampro and then get into the ways in which we're utilising sheep BRD tags in our seed stock business. Um, so Lampro, it is a prime lamb seed stock business. We're based um, in the southeast of Riverina in southern New South Wales um, at Holbrook. So if you think um, between Wagga and Albury, we're pretty much smack bang in the middle. Um, we're 600 mil rainfall and that's pretty much winter dominant. Um, although you wouldn't know it this year, it's, it's green currently when it shouldn't be, um, but we're not complaining. <laughs> um, but yeah, as a, as a seed stock business, we produce both maternal and terminal genetics. Um, maternal is, they take up about 60% of our sheep um, in the prime lines. And then we have three different terminal um, breeding programs, one being a pole dorset, um, one being a Hampshire down and one being a terminal composite called the tradies, which is a pole dorset infused with a south down, which really just goes to um, produce trade lambs with plenty of cover um, and early growth um, turned off mum. I guess our motto is really to identify and multiply. Um, so we want to identify animals that will increase kilograms of lamb per hectare, but also maximise that dollar value of every lamb, of every kilogram of lamb produced. And once we find those animals, um, we multiply using artificial insemination, embryo transfer and natural mating. Um, our, our biggest philosophy, philosophy is we want to measure production traits in our seed stock sheep um, in a commercial environment or commercial conditions. So we want to run our sheep like commercial clients, um, but still capture all, the, capture all that seed stock data. Um, so we run them very hard and we run them in quite large mobs to see who really rises to the top and who falls out at the bottom. Um, so we've been, well, the Lampro is owned by the Bull family um, and they've been breeding rams for three decades now. Um, and we're constantly screening breeds to try and increase the profitability of our sheep. Um, we want to ensure that our clients are at the forefront of production and profitability. Um, at the end of the day, we want to be in a profitable business. So we want our clients to be profitable as well. Um, data is core for our business. Um, we capture as much data as possible on every animal that's run in our enterprise. Um, and it's what drives our decision making is data. Um, and if we didn't have EID tags, we probably couldn't capture as much data as we do. Um, and we wouldn't be able to collect it in the accurate and efficient manner that we do. Um, there's plenty of gear out there um, that it, people are using, but we use true test gear. Um, and that's purely because that's what we started with. Um, we haven't had any issues, but yeah, definitely not advocating for true test. Um, we've just been using it since early 2000s and yeah, it's served its purpose. But as I said, there's plenty of um, gear out there that'll help you collect that EID data. Um, just a bit more on, on the background of us. Um, so we sell rams as ram lambs um, at five to seven months of age. Um, and there's two main reasons why we do that. We want to shorten that generation interval and we want to maximise the genetic gain for our clients. 
So and typically most people would sell rams at 18 months to two years old. Um, our clients are getting them in their own flocks and using them at that five to seven months of age. So they're just getting access to better genetics earlier, which is really ensuring that their genetic gain is continuing to climb. Um, in terms of our scale, um, yeah, we've currently got 354 clients on the books um, and they range from our most northern client is Gaira um, and then they come right down throughout New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia and, and into Tassie. So our genetics are performing in some very varied client, like climatic conditions, um, which is exciting and challenging at the same time. Um, but it just means with that large genetic pool, um, we, can, we can produce the genetics um, for our clients in those varied climatic regions. Uh, in terms of, so our ram selling season, it starts in November with our on-farm auction um and we'll sell rams right up until next week um and this year we'll go yeah close to 3100 ram lambs will be sold um into clients around australia back on farm um yeah so this year in 2022 we'll join 10,000 performance recorded use we're actually on the back end of joining now um we're finishing up with you lambs so it's yeah that started um november 28 and yeah we'll be finished in the next four weeks um, which will be nice and yeah that'll equate to almost thirteen thousand lambs tagged at birth um so our labor force um it's a it is a family-owned business and it's very much still run by the family um outside of family <laughs> labor units there's four of us um so yeah there's there's plenty of work to do so I guess um, now talking EID tags, which is what we're here to talk about. Um, so every animal in our seed stock enterprise has a full pedigree. Um, and by having a pedigree, we can then generate um, Australian sheep breeding values or also better known as estimated breeding values. Um, we then want to collect as much raw data as possible on as many production traits. Um, so whether that's weight, whether that's fertility and preg scanning, whether that's eating quality from carcass data or consumer sensory testing, um, we want to capture that data and submit it into the land plan database to generate the accuracy or increase the accuracy of breeding values, but also find those outliers that really are going to drive profit and production um, in sheep enterprises. So to do that, we do have an EID tag in every animal. Um, so that ram on the left-hand side, that's a ram lamb um, that's gone out the gate already, but it just, that's the type of EID tag we're using. Again, similar with True Test, um, there's plenty of tag brands out there. Um, we've been using Shearwells for a while now and they just seem to work for us. But yeah, again, not advocating for Shearwell, just that's what we've seen seem to work for us. Um, on a cost basis, they're $1.35 um, per tag, um, which is, which is only, it seems to be a small investment for the amount of data we can capture with that tag. Um, it really, I can't emphasize enough how much we utilize those EID tags um, for $1.35. So I thought um, just to really showcase how we use EID tags and step through the whole animal husbandry calendar over the 12 month period. Um, so it starts with joining. So we single sire mate um, everything um, and to be able to, establish that pedigree we need to re record joinings um, so here in that picture we've got you'll see there's well there's silage racks all up the left hand side but essentially it's containment pens um, one ram per oh these pens vary so there's anywhere from 60 use up to 120 use per pen um, we simply record those matings run them in the yards run the use down the race um, using a true test one just wand every you that's in that um, race full and she's gone to that ram so that's, yeah, that's the initial um, record. We then um, step through to preg scanning. So this is a contract preg scanner. We don't do any of it ourselves. Um, so on the side of that crate, he's got an EID panel reader and that as soon as a ewe runs into the crate, it's recording her EID. He can then assign her preg status as well as the number of fetuses she has. So whether she's wet or dry, she's got a single, a twin or a triplet. Um, we then, yeah, collect all that data it gets submitted into land plan and that's how we get our fertility data such as number of lambs weaned yearly number of lambs weaned conception which are a big driving um big traits that people select on um, to drive their production 
So then we go on to lambing um, or the tagging at birth that I touched on earlier. And this is where you first um, get that EID applied. So it's that the EID goes in the day they're born. Um, so you'll see the black lambs on the left-hand side, they're still pretty wet, their cords are dripping, <laughs> but um, tags are applied that day. And on that same day, we'll record who mum is, the day they're born, their birth type, their rear type, um, their birth weight and their gender. Um, so yeah, she's an orange tag, so she's 2018, her visual is 1800, and then we'll, yeah, you've got two little ram lambs there. Um, then we've got Edie on the right hand side, um, she's collecting birth data on um, some embryo lambs that we had born last year. Um, so yeah, plenty of lambs to be caught. Um, yeah, and it's essentially where the, the EID <laughs> starts. Moving on, um, lamb marking. So because we tag everything at birth, we then have a full pedigree from there on. So I register all our lambs before lamb marking. That way we've got a mid-parent ASVV on all production traits as they come through the cradles. So that top picture, you can see we've got a true test um, XR screen sitting on top of the cradles. That's got your full set of um, breeding values plus their pedigree. And essentially any ram lamb that comes through the cradles, that's good type, but it's also in the top 10% for his breed index, we'll then go and genotype him. So that bottom um, photo is actually a tissue vial with a tissue sample um, and we'll send them off to the lab and get a full DNA profile of those lambs. Being able to do that's been um, groundbreaking for us because we can capture that data earlier. We can have those animals genotyped by the time they're going through the sale ring at five months of age. And it's really firmed up the accuracies of those hard to measure traits, such as that fertility data and your carcass data. Um, it's also been, you get a much greater handle on the um, sire lines and the genetics that you're um, using in your flock because you're seeing um, particular sire lines come through those cradles and you'll see, oh, this sire is of great interest because these lambs are always big and sappy and fat. Whereas this one, yeah, they've got a bit of work to do. So, yeah, you really get to learn your sheep um, quite well. Um, then going on to weaning, so we collect all weaning weights um, around that day 100. Um, so you'll see we've got a sheep sheep handler there, Racewell Tapari. Um, we do a lot of sheep movements through these, um, but every one of them has a, an EID reader on the side and weigh bars underneath, and you'll see there's a true test um, screen up on the left as well. And again, you're seeing seeing those pedigrees and ASBVs as well as capturing the weights at the same time. So all those weights will then go into um, land plan to generate the weaning weight ASBVs. We also ultrasound muscle and fat scan all lambs at post weaning. Um, so this is essentially getting an eye muscle depth and a fat um, depth. So on the left hand side, we've got Jake, again, it's a um, contractor that comes in and does this. Um, and he's got an EID panel reader on the side of his crate, um, which as a lamb runs in, captures that EID, captures the weight. He then muscle scans and fat depths it and yeah, types that in. And yeah, on that right hand side, that's actually a, an image of the ultrasound screen. So you can see the depth of that muscle and then the fat on top as well. And then finally, the rams go out the gate and um, everyone's scanned as they leave, leave the farm. Um, so we've got full traceability of where all our rams go to. So we, as part of our service, we deliver all rams um, to the client's farm gate. So this is actually the, the Monday after our auction um, in November. We headed down to Western Districts in Victoria to deliver 650 rams. Um, and we know exactly where every one of those rams goes. Um, and yeah, we, before ones came in, we didn't actually do this and it was hard to keep track of where rams were going. And um, this has been groundbreaking for us. Um, clients will often ask, can we have updated figures on our rams for this year's joining? And I can easily go and get them updated figures because we've got a full traceability of what rams have gone where. Um, and that's including for private grade rams as well. So yeah, having EIDs and ones has been, um, groundbreaking for us. So I guess touching on the benefits of EID tags, um, that accurate data collection is, is paramount in any seed stock business. Um, so having those EID really does eliminate human error. 
it is doesn't matter if you're dyslexic or not, you'll still mix numbers up when you're going through sheep all day. So having a four-digit number, it's quite often someone will call something out and you can't quite hear them and you'll put a two instead of a three. Um, so having EIDs, it eliminates all of that human error. Um, they have they are extremely time efficient. Um, if we had to record pen and paper, every weaning weight or every preg scan um, status, we'd be there for days. Um, tracking animal performance, Naomi and Ron definitely touched on this. Um, seeing those average daily gains um, is crucial for us. We're in such a tight timeline, um, getting rams to sale weight in five months. They've got to be at 55 kilos. Um, we need to make sure our rams are moving forward and on an upward trajectory and having them pass through um, those sheep handlers, which give you an average daily gain, clearly tells you where you're at. Um, and it also becomes quite a money saver, even in commercial um, situations. So if you you are losing weight, well, what's the issue? Have we got a worm burden? Have we is the ration not fulfilling our performance needs? Um, you can pick up on those early and really save yourself a lot of money. Um, they've definitely become, yeah, extremely beneficial in drafting animals more accurately into their performance groups, whether that's kill animals or pregnant ewes. Um, yeah, the, the tight ranges you can now draft your kill lambs into as a consequence of having EID tags and auto drafters is pretty impressive. Um, and then I touched on it earlier, just having that data always in front of you just makes you learn your sheep a lot easier and a lot quicker, which is something that we've found extremely beneficial in our business. And that that's me done. <laughs> Thanks, Rosie. That's fantastic to see the sheer amount of data you guys are going through and doing it on that many um, animals is quite a feat, I can imagine. And even the logistics of it would be huge. Um, <laughs> So I, I have a few questions. I don't think any have come through. If anyone has questions, please pop them in the chat window so we can ask. Um, but I was intrigued with the $1.35 per tag. Have you guys done anything to put figures around what value or what return on investment you're getting for that $1.35? I imagine it would be immense. Um, uh, we haven't put any. Yeah, no, that's something we haven't done. But, yeah, just the, the sheer labour that you save on. Um, I know labour's a... Yeah, certainly an issue in every industry and it's it takes the, the need for labour units out of the yards immensely. Um, I don't have a dollar figure for it, sorry. But, yeah, and just that human error taking it out of each process is, yeah, groundbreaking for us. Yeah, I imagine it would be huge. Um, so I'm interested to see what's the feedback from the clients on the data that you're able to provide and the format it's come in. Are they finding it useful, too much data? Is there more data they want to know about? Yep. No, data, our clients love data. <laughs> they, yeah, I often, every year I'll have clients, yeah, I'll be giving updated figures on all their RAM teams. Um, yeah, they just want to know as much information as possible on their sheet. And I think that's what draws them into our client base is because we collect so much data um, right from conception to to the plate. Um, and they want to make sure the sheep they're breeding are profitable, which is yeah, we do a lot in that space. Um, yeah, we've we've started our own land brand to be able to ensure our clients have got the high end markets to sell their lamb into. It's yeah, it's a lot of two way use of that data because by us um, doing all the work to produce those high quality animals or rams, they can our clients can then produce the progeny that can go back into those high end markets. Um, we do have a program which we're currently rolling out with clients at the moment, which puts a commercial index on every um, ewe in their flock, um, which is pretty exciting um, in their maternal flocks. So basically it puts a dollar value index on each ewe based on mid-parent value. And then when they collect um, raw data on farms, such as PregScan, it really individualizes that index. Um, the up It's only new, but the uptake has been quite quite good we've already got 30,000 news on the database um yeah in the grand scheme of things there's there'd be almost 500,000 maternal ewes running around Australia so we've still got a fair bit of room to to move with that but um yeah the uptake's been quite quite good initially yeah and so that sort of leads into what my next question was is have you seen a flow-on effect with your clients using EIDs um and recording their own herds as well and getting value from that yeah, yeah. Uh, so a big thing for our clients is selling ewe lambs um, into the replace, like ewe lamb replacement market. Um, you now have clients that have 
spent quite a lot of money on their rams that have got those high genetic merit rams um, that's flowing through into their ewe lambs and they're the clients that are targeted um, to purchase replacement ewe lambs off. Um, we do host a um, ewe lamb sale at the end of each year. Um, this year we had about 20,000 um, clients put, 20,000 ewe lambs clients go into the sale. Um, one client didn't even have to put ewe lambs into the sale because they were sold prior to the auction because they were so highly sought after. Yeah, which is pretty impressive. He's, these guys were selling 2,000 ewe lambs and their agent was just taking phone calls um, for the demand of their, their ewe lambs. Fantastic. It certainly looks like there's a really strong future with collecting that data and utilising it on farm. So thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it, Rosie. No worries. Um, so we're now going to jump into something a little bit different. We've got Andrew Zipson from um, Gallagher who's coming to talk about e Shepherd. So Andrew grew up on a farm in country Victoria and has turned to engineering. He started working for, uh, I can't pronounce this properly, I'm sorry, Andrew Argusons. Um, about five years ago, as a hardware engineer manager and has now transitioned to a customer focused role with a beta program trial and working on how systems operate on properties. So to give you some background on eShepherd, it's a virtual fencing um, technology that was founded in 2014. Um, and it was acquired by Gallagher in 2021, which as someone who hasn't been involved with it says to me that Gallagher sees a lot of commercial value in the technology and it's going to be coming if they've put the investment into it. And they're currently working some, um, running some programs on commercial properties to test the system in various applications. So I'll ask Andrew to share his screen um, and you can jump in. I'm really keen to hear this one myself. Thanks, Andrew. Fantastic, all right. Let me just um, get my screen up. <clears throat> I hope you guys can hear me okay. Yep, that's fine. Excellent, all right, sorry. Uh, share screen, this one. Okay, I'll just bring the presentation over and I'll flip that one. Okay, can you guys see that presentation okay? Excellent. All right, now let's get into it. So, um, right, I think we've already done the introductions. Yes, I'm Andrew Zipson. So, um, Applications and Customer Success Manager is my title at the moment. So, working with those beta trial partners. So let's give a quick overview of the history of, of uh, E Shepherd and, and how we got there. So we were founded as Adjacents back in 2014. Um, we started developing this virtual fencing technology that um, we licensed from the CSIRO. So they had developed it about 10 years earlier, but it was really um, uh, too early on. The technology just wasn't quite available to be able to make it a reality. So um, by 2014, that certainly had changed and, and we um, jumped on board to be able to develop it um, commercially. So, and then, as we said in the introduction, um, Gallagher had been a key investor right from the very beginning. Um, they saw some huge potential in this technology. It really complements their electric fencing um, uh, solution that they already have on the market. So. Um, they were involved from the beginning and then just acquired the remainder of Adjacents in um, 2021. So we've got, um, uh, we are operating across a couple of different sites. So um, down in Melbourne, we've got the main uh, engineering and development team. Um, and we have a site up in Queensland, just out of Ipswich, uh, where we, it's our eShepherd Innovation Centre. That's where we run a, a number of cattle and, and we do all our a new research and development work up uh, up there. So a few development highlights here. We've done over 60 research trials um, to date. Uh, well, I think it's a little bit out of date, actually. There's a few more than that now. And we've done um, you know, more, well more than 20 now um, farm trials um, with over 3,000 neck bands. So they're deployed out on commercial properties and really testing out the the various applications that people have for this virtual fencing system. And um, yeah, so we currently have a, a fully subscribed beta program and that's underway predominantly in Queensland, but also in New Zealand. That's a little bit of a history. So some of the challenges that um, I'm sure many um, beef producers are very familiar with um, and you know, why we are developing this system to try and solve some of these challenges. 
So we know that there are significant uh, labour shortages in, in the rural sector. Um, most, most operations are still just um, you know, uh, a family run operation and, and labour is hard to come by and expensive. So that's a, a real pressure to try and reduce that. Um, grazing practices, um, there's a lot of goodwill to put um, new and, and better grazing practices in place, but they're quite difficult to implement in practice, um, whether you're doing it via some temporary electric fencing or, or permanent fencing that's expensive, um, so, and, and they're not very flexible, so there's some challenges there. Of course, we increasingly have environmental pressures on us to um, um, protect the environment, protect sensitive areas, um, make sure that we, uh, we don't um, damage the environment. Uh, resources are becoming um, more and more scarce, so you know, demand is increasing for, for beef production, and with the uh, limited resources, we have to do the best we can. And then we also have the challenges of, of you know, finding a, a work-life balance um, as farmers, so uh, it's a uh, it's a tough job. It's you're on the go all the time. So anything that we can do there to reduce those pressures are of huge um, benefit. So a little bit about the e shepherd product vision. So at the core of it is is a, a neck band that goes onto an animal, um, and really that neck band allows us to implement some virtual fencing to contain animals without the need for any internal fencing on the property. So at the moment, you know, people aren't going and ripping up their internal fencing, of course, um, but you still have the challenge of having some very, very large internal paddocks that um, you can't really utilize the pasture um, to, to the um, best performance. So with virtual fencing, that allows you to break up those larger paddocks inside, intensify that grazing and um, improve your utilization of those pastures. It also gives you now the ability to automate that grazing. So once you, uh, once you have an idea of what um, fodder is available, then you can automatically um, shift your animals around to uh, graze down those pastures and make the best of it without having to go out into the paddock at all to put up any um, physical fences, of course. And then we come to the, the data side of things, which um, as uh, Rosie just mentioned, you know, data is everything these days, and it's certainly going to be the case for eShepherd as well. Um, we, we are able to collect a huge amount of data with every animal wearing this neck band. We gain so much um, insight into what they're doing, um, and we can now start to bring this data together with into the larger Gallagher ecosystem which of course um, you're probably aware that Gallagher has already a bunch of products on the market as well to um, weigh animals and scan their um, NLIS tags um, or their EID tags. Uh, so we can pair all that data together to get really powerful insights. So that's that larger um, integration there um, to really then drive for productivity and profitability. So the solutions that the eShepherd system brings to the, um, oh, sorry, what have I done here? Oh. Right, <laughs> the solutions that, that uh, the eShepherd brings to the uh, property is that um, it reduces labor, right? You can put up um, kilometers of virtual fence lines just from sitting um, at the breakfast table with a cup of coffee. You know, it just doesn't take any time at all to draw, draw those virtual fences. You can put them up anywhere. They don't get washed away by floods or they're not affected by fire. So, um, And you can adjust uh, according to your seasons. Um, you can adjust where you want to put your animals. So that's a, a massive reduction in labour. Um, by utilising the system then to really manage your pastures better, you get better utilization, you get better regeneration of the pastures, and you really start to improve the pasture health um, by implementing those um, intensive grazing practices, um, which then over the years really starts to turn things around on the property and increases your return on the investment. 
Um, you can also use it to safeguard the environment. So yeah, in New Zealand, there is a, a, a massive drive for this. Um, they have uh, some stock exclusion regulations coming into force in um, 2025 where they need to keep all of their animals, all of their cattle out of their waterways, anything that is a waterway. And in New Zealand, there are a lot of waterways. So um, they've got a dire need for a solution to this problem. Um, physical fencing, again, is, is a really difficult one to implement because uh, you know, fencing off waterways, I'm sure you're all aware, is, is very difficult to do um, effectively. So having a, a solution that allows you to keep animals out of waterways to you know, prevent that damage um, or, or create sediment, um, uh, as is the case up in the barrier reef regions, um, is a huge benefit. And again, there, of course, um, getting a, a bit of life uh, work-life balance back is, is uh, always a benefit. So this is a very wordy slide. So I'll just try and skim over some of the key points there. Um, so eShepherd really is a virtual fencing and herding system. It's, it's really quite a lot more than just virtual fencing. It's, that's kind of the easy thing to latch onto, but really um, it, it is really a stock management system because you are collecting a lot of information about your animals, about the location of those animals and about your pastures. So it's a, it's a much, much bigger platform than just virtual fencing. Um, I'd mentioned this before, uh, the, the core development was done by the CSIRO, so it's backed with, by some really good research. And of course, um, Adjacents and now Gallagher have really pushed it forward to, to take us to where we are at the moment. Um, we do a lot of monitoring of uh, the animal's wealth as well. Um, uh, sorry, the animal's well-being, I should say, <laughs> health and well-being. Um, so we have the ability to send alerts to farmers if something's, uh, you know, something unusual is going on. So if one of your high value cows has separated itself from the herd and is you know, somewhere bogged down maybe, um, and it's not moving, uh, you get an automatic alert sent to your mobile phone to tell you, hey, something's, something's uh, unusual there, you should go and have a look. So yeah, that can, that can make a huge impact if you can get to certain emergency situations that are going on out on your property that you may not otherwise be aware of. So, and then of course, that um, the, the ability to easily implement the rotational or cell grazing or strip grazing to really optimize the pasture, pasture utilization, that's, uh, that's just a massive win. So um, that's going to be a big, big part of um, the system's capability. So just a little bit more detail about how the system actually works. So we have a, a GPS um, enabled neck band that goes on every animal. Um, we'll go into a little bit more detail about that neck band in a minute. That neck band then communicates to a base station that is located on your property. So that's via a low power, long range radio communication technology. Um, the base station then connects to the internet via the um, mobile network. So 3G or 4G connection. Um, that's uh, that's what we are using currently predominantly but of course many rural places don't have a 3g or 4g mobile data connection uh, essentially we just need to be able to connect to the internet so there are other solutions out there for that um, beyond 3g and 4g but that's the easiest at the moment so that's what we're focusing on then that information gets sent to the internet or the cloud, um, uh, which we can then access and manipulate from uh, either the computer or a smartphone or a tablet. So that's the basics of the operation. So the way that the system works um, is you've, you've drawn a virtual fence and that virtual fence boundary is now sent to the neck band. So when an animal approaches that virtual fence boundary, the first thing that happens is the neck band um, sends out a tone, so it beeps at that animal. Uh, if the animal ignores that, that beeping tone and just continues to walk over the boundary, then the neck band delivers an aversive but harmless electric pulse. So, and that pulse is delivered across a couple of electrodes on the, on the back of the, or the underside of the neck band, um, and it goes on the back of the neck of the animal. 
So it's quite a different sensation to a normal electric fence, which is more of a, a full body experience, if you like, you know, from the point where the animal touches the, a normal electric fence, it kind of goes right through their body in, into the ground. Uh, the neck band is different. It does just apply that pulse across uh, two, two electrodes on the back, which is more of a stinging sensation, if you like. So it's, um, and, and harmless. So uh, it really doesn't impact the welfare of the animals. And, and then most importantly, the animals learn very quickly that the audio tone means that if they, if they don't change their behavior, it's followed by a pulse. So they learn to respond just to the audio tone and they start to turn around whenever they hear audio tones. And we can see that very quickly for a herd of animals where um, after only a few days of, of um, their first experience with the system, um, they start to predominantly respond just to the audio tones and the number of pulses that get delivered just um, uh, continue to decrease. So let's have a look at, at the neck band in a little bit more detail. So I've already spoken a little bit about the, the long range um, communication radio that's in there. So it's um, uh, a LoRa communication device, uh, uses very little power and can communicate over very long distances. Um, we've got a, a durable strap and a counterweight um, that keeps the neck band at the very top of the neck. The, um, the neck band itself has a motion tracking um, sensor inside as well. So we can actually tell what um, the animals are doing. So we can say, we can see when animals are resting or whether they're moving or whether they're grazing. So we get quite a lot of um, animal behavior insights and, and they are all sent to the cloud um, at a regular basis. In fact, um, I think I haven't touched on that, but it's every 10 minutes that, that we send an update to the cloud to tell, tell you where the animal is, what it's up to, whether it's um, still moving or not, or whether it stopped moving. So all that information gets sent every 10 minutes for every um, animal out in the paddock. It has a GPS, of course, to track its location. Um, there's two solar panels and, and they predominantly at the moment drive the size of the device. Um, we, we do I want to make sure that the battery is always charged um, throughout the entire season. So for that reason, we've got a couple of solar panels um, that, that make sure that that's the case. Um, there's a long life battery inside as well. Um, it's, uh, it can last up to between five and seven years. Um, and of course, it has an integrated audio speaker inside it that gives that um, the tone. Okay. A little bit about the base station. So here's a here's a picture of the base station here on the right. Um, it's fully self-contained, solar powered. Again, just a nice big solar panel on there and a, a battery inside this case here. Um, the communication range to the neck bands is, uh, as I said before, it's about 15 kilometers or, or more if you've got line of sight. So you know, like in this picture here, you've got this beautiful line of sight over to, you know, the distant hills. Um, if you had a neck band over there, you'd have no problems um, communicating with the base station. In reality, though, that's that's really the case. There's either hills in the way or there's trees in the way. So the effective communication range is, um, is you know, below the 15 kilometres. It's usually 10 kilometres on most properties or if it's very hilly or uh, lots of trees, then that may get cut down further down to five or something. And we might need to install two base stations to provide adequate communication coverage for a property. Uh, it is a, quite a simple device uh, base station to install. So a single person can put this up and it's quite easy to relocate. There's some ground anchors that get driven into the ground. You can pull those out and, and just relocate the base station to another place on your property. So if you are moving animals around over a season, then you know, the base station can move with it. And yes, here's a little bit more about the communication um, capabilities. So we can have uh, 1200 neck bands reporting through that base station every 10 minutes. If your herd size becomes larger than 1200, then we just need to start in increasing that um, communication interval. So that might go up to 20 minutes to handle double the number of neck bands. 
Then we have a, an, a user interface, um, of course. So it's, uh, it is all um, web app driven. So it, you just open up a, a browser window and um, log into the eShepherd website, and then you have full control of what, um, what you wanna do with your animals. So you can do that on, on any computer. You don't need to install a special program or anything. You can do it from anywhere in the world. As long as you've got an internet connection, you can monitor the location of your um, neck bands or your animals from, from your smartphone, right? So you can just pull out your phone and have a look where your animal, animals are at any time, as long as you have an internet connection. So it's pretty powerful in that sense. Um, some of the features, again, this is where the, the value of data is coming in more and more. Um, yeah, with, with 10 minutely reports of where all your animals are, you start to collect a lot of data about uh, um, your animal's behavior. So we have some basic features already um, where we can generate heat maps to give you an idea of where animals are spending the most amount of time in a particular paddock that you've confined them to. Um, so we can see here these red and uh, yellow zones are, are um, places that animals spend more time in and they probably have spent less time in the back of this paddock here. So those kind of insights can start to give you some ideas on how you can better um, utilize your pastures by possibly subdividing a larger paddock like this into, into smaller areas and, and actually force the animals to stay in in areas where, where maybe the grass isn't quite as palatable, but you, you want to utilize that and, and really try and improve it by having them graze that area. So that's um, the benefit of the system there. And then again, speaking to data integrations, um, Gallagher already has a, a Gallagher animal performance application where they're tracking the, the weight of, of your, all your animals. Um, you know, you have your, the Gallagher scales, the Gallagher EID readers, um, all of that already. Um, we're bringing a lot of data together there. Now, when you combine that with the data that comes from the eShepherd platform as well, you just start to get insights into your animal's performance that is just unprecedented. It's just... Uh, Yep, they're going to open up uh, new new opportunities in in a lot of places. Just a little bit about the the beef market opportunity alone um, across the globe. Um, there are a few limitations that we currently have in Australia, which is a shame. Um, so. Uh, both um, New South Wales and Victoria, we, we don't have um, the ability to operate the system at the moment. Um, that is because some legislation was brought in around dog and cat collars well before the um, advent of, of um, uh, virtual fencing solutions for beef cattle. So we, there's some, some work going on to, to change some of that legislation. Um, we still need some legislation change in South Australia and in um, Northern Territory as well. But um, so there's, yeah, it's a little bit unfortunate in Australia itself, but Queensland as, is one of the largest markets, of course, and we do have the ability to operate freely there. So, and also Tasmania and Western Australia. You know, then globally looking uh, across to some other countries, uh, USA has some 55 million head of cattle. So there's a, a massive opportunity there. And of course, South America is even larger with 300 million cattle. Um, New Zealand presents a, a really interesting opportunity because of their um, stock exclusion regulations that are coming in. So we are really working hard to, to find a solution to that problem and make it viable. And then Canada, of course, uh, is a market as well that um, is available. Now, just a little bit of... Uh, and... Andrew, I'll, I'll just have to get you to wrap up, please, so yep. we can keep on time. Sorry. Thank sorry, you. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, this is the last, last slide. So, so this is really just a quick um, a summary about our, our time to uh, enter the market. So currently, we are still running a fully subscribed beta program. That's likely to be the case for all of 2022 and into 2023. Um, but then at that point, we'd expect to start launching in various regions. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and um, hand it back to you. 
Perfect. Thank you, Andrew. Um, it's really interesting and I'm quite excited to see how it um, rolls out and even in terms of emergency management and moving stock away from flood areas and bushfires on farm without fences, physical fences, um, I can see huge potential. With that, so thank you very much for your time, Andrew. Um, we're going to move on now to Edwina Warby, who's with Black Box Company. Um, so Edwina's currently based on her family property uh, near Roma in southwest Queensland and has been with Black Box since July last year. After working as an accountant and analyst for the past few years, Edwina is excited to return to a job in the beef industry. And a bit about Black Box, it's a cloud-based software program that ingests raw data from right along the beef supply chain and instantly turns it into key insights with the ultimate aim of increasing productivity. Um, something that I'm really excited about with this technology is that it's been developed by producers and extension staff to do a lot of work with producers and can see how that data can be used on farm um, and how the data is collected. So I think it's a, going to be a fantastic technology. So I'm really excited to hear some more about it from my own perspective, but um, for all of you guys as well. So I'll hand over to you now. And when, um, if, Andrew, have you finished sharing your screen there? Uh, yeah, yes, I have. Did I stop sharing? I, I think I stopped sharing. Are you able to share yours, Edwina? Um, yeah, all good. Perfect. I'll leave you with it. Thank you. You guys able to see that screen now? Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, cool. So um, Naomi gave a brief summary and I'm mindful of time, so we will jump into the dashboards um, straight away. But so Blackbox uses the data that's already been collected um, from cross side right through to feedlot and carcass and then link it all to, together to allow um, informed decisions to be made to then increase productivity and profitability. So Emma um, Black and Shannon Spate, both Xander McDonald Award winners, um, met through the award and built this product as they were working with producers um, and could see a lot of data being collected cross side, but not getting any further than a spreadsheet or talking to a lot of producers that hate spending time in the office, um, trying to clean data and pretty much fighting with their computers. Um, so this software has been built with a number of pastoral companies and family businesses and now working with a number of the big feedlots and processes, um, developing the dashboards firsthand with industry um, partners, so right along the supply chain. And we've now got data for about 1.5 million animals. So um, I'll jump into the dashboards. I'm going to make an assumption that you're all mainly trading producers, but we will touch on the other dashboards briefly. So I'll start with our fertility dashboard. Um, all of the dashboards look quite similar with charts, filters along the top. So you're able to select um, one or multiple properties and change your dates along the top. You can then dive right into paddocks um, and breeds specifically. So KPIs are listed up the top, number of head, average weaning weight, pregnancy percentages, weaning percentages and wet rebury percentages. Um, so similar to what Rosie touched on with the sheep, it's um, similar sort of data being collected in the beef industry. And as the common theme today has been pretty much data is the way that the industry is going. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it pretty much. Um, the more data that's being collected, obviously the more insights they're able to make and management decisions being made back on farm. Um, so these charts are all interactive and I should mention that this demo data is a northern data set so obviously might look different to some of the southern um, operations. So if you are keeping both wet and dries you're able to dive down and select dries only and see how they performed or just the wets. Body condition score obviously has a huge effect on fertility so as I select this you can see the percentage Percentage um, for pregnancy changes quite dramatically um, as you move down to a body condition score of 2 or 2.5. Um, some other charts, and I will quickly, briefly touch on a few of these. So um, if there's any questions, just let me know if you want to dive into something. But you're able to select year of birth, so how those older cows are performing compared to those younger heifers. 
This has been um, particularly interesting on our my family property where we've introduced genetics at a certain year. So we want to see how that flow and effect um, has worked with some of the heifers. Um, so on our property, we're looking at a much tighter pregnancy percentages. We don't keep our dries. Um, bulls are only in for a number of months. So these calf to calf periods and similar to a lot more southern operations um, are a lot tighter and calving pattern down here is obviously only a few months. So if that's the case, um, you're able to then look at weight at first conception. So looking at your early maturing heifers and what's, what's cycling at 250 kilos or less compared to those ones that are taking to 400 kilos to be joined. Um, up north, there's a lot of companies and producers that are using these charts to make culling decisions. So anything that's not producing a calf under every 18 months, you're actually able to select those cows. And over on the right here, there's a list builder, which allows you to add those EIDs to the list and feed that back to your crush side system. So we ingest data from any crush side system. We work with um, Gallagher Systems, TrueTest, Sapien, E-Link, Stockmate, all that sort of thing. Um, so pretty much if it can be in a CSV, we ingest it. Um, down the bottom gives you a carving pattern and then the dry analysis over here. So these animals were due to carve in February and they've come back in dry. So have they lost as a fetus or at branding? Um, you know, as a calf, I should say, after branding. Um, so we'll dive onto the growing dashboards. This is what we call our growing management dashboard. This is looking into just animals that are left on your property. We also have a performance dashboard, which ties in pricing data from down the supply chain. So if you've sold it through Auctions Plus, Feedlot, um, private sale yards or carcass data. So again, you can select your property um, and filter by, you know, just your wiener heifers or sale, um, steers, or if you're breeding wiener bulls, it can be quite a good comparison there. Again, KPIs up at the top, number of head, average first weight, average weeks growing and average ADG. And if you are trading animals, you can include that price and data in there. So this data first weight allows um, people to compare early weaning versus late weaning, or if you're trading, what time of the year you're bringing those animals in at. Similarly, number of head by first weight. So what's your average weaning weight or what weight are you bringing those animals in as trade animals and how is that affecting their performance? Or what trends can you see from that? So um, these dashboards are allowing producers to select their high and low performance. And some of them are then going and adding their high performance to a list and just pulling tail hairs and doing genomic testing on them. And then again, for their low performance, as we know, genomic testing can be um, quite expensive. So they're just selecting their best and worst animals to look further into them. So how they've used these charts is um, any animals that are on property for a similar amount of time, so 50 or 60 weeks, um, you can select those animals that have gained 200 kilos versus the ones that have gained 250 to 300 um, and are performing a lot better. You'll see as I change that chart, breed and property of, ori breed and property of origin charts are changing with that. Um, weight for age allows producers to look, you know, if they're looking at an abattoir versus a feedlot market, um, those animals, again, that are 20 months of age, who's gaining 250 kilo versus 300 to 400 and how and where they've come from or what breed they might be. So this property of origin chart um, allows you to drill into their place of birth. So if you own um, breeding properties you're able to compare the performance of each of those properties or if you're trading animals where they're coming from we've actually just added a source pick which actually takes the supplier's pick so as you know um, as a trader you might be buying from a place that not they didn't necessarily breed those animals so um, able to easily compare suppliers and feedlots are really drilling into that. Um, they're able to go back to animals that were in the feedlot in 2017 or 2018 um, and look where they were supplied from and how those people's cattle performed. Um, breed, able to drill in and see how my crossbreds are conforming, 
performing sorry compared to the straight Brahmins. Um, so I should also dive in. You're able to select by paddocks here. And I know that this paddock, um, there was crop in there compared to something that was just grass and see how their ADGs are performing. Um, we're doing a lot of agronomy trials here at the moment. So it's quite interesting seeing what's working in terms of fattening steers um, or just pasture in, improvement for the cows. So you're able to um, select a purchase price if you're trading and see how those animals or what, what time of the year you bought them, um, that kind of thing. Year of birth. So of those steers, those number eights and number nines that st are still on property, what are they and why are they dragging the chain? Um, a quick summary of how each pick has performed. And then these three most recent ADG charts is looking at animals that have had four or five weights. So instead of just looking at what their current ADG is doing, you're able to look back at what the second most recent ADG was and the one before that. So if you have animals that are dragging the chain, um, you know, you might know that this weight was back in July. So what are, what are those ones that are the lowest performers? And have they picked up or are they still the lower, you know, lighter end of the mob um, or low performing animals, I should say. And then you're able to, again, add them to this list builder and feed that back to your crush side system to say, you know, get rid of them earlier than a feedlot weight, they're eating grass, they're not um, performing. So we've had a lot of producers using that those charts to create lists to send back to their um, crush side collection devices. And this predicted weights table, again, they're using that to um, create draft lists. So you're able to change the ADG along the top and forecast what they might be doing each month. Um, I should mention here, we're working close, closely with OptiWay and um, along with what Na Naomi and Rob were saying, it's been an absolute game changer here. We've been able to um, book, weight, book trucks off what the OptiWay is telling us and it's been, you know, one or two out, head out every time. So it's pretty close without having to muster them and handle them all the time. Um, so from that, I was able to see, you know, these animals are doing 1.5 in the OptiWay. So I'm going to have 70 ready in the weight category of 40, 400, 450 kilos in March, but I actually want to send um, 100. So I'm able to grab those 27 in the lower weight bracket and either put them in a better paddock or, um, you know, supplement them to speed them along as well so that I'm able to send 100. Um, we've, we've seen a lot of producers and companies start to use that table to forecast what they're going to have ready each month um, and those ones that have a close relationship with their feedlot, being able to, um, you know, communicate with them and, and tell them what they're going to have ready when. So um, growing performance, very similar, but just tying in that dollar value. So you're able to skip down here and grab those ones that, you know, your highest performing carcass prices compared to those lower ones and it changes all the data. Um, so all those charts are quite similar and up the top this certain demo does that didn't have any purchase or sale price. They all went to um, the abattoir. So it's not a great example of those charts, but if you did have purchase and sale data, that's where they would show up. Um, I'll jump into carcass and we do have carcass and MSA dashboards that have a whole lot of charts on them um, based off the carcass feedback that you're getting. So we're able to take that in from any abattoir um, if you are receiving that data. And again, it just lists the KPIs up the top average dollars received in average carcass weight. Um, and you're allowed to make, you're able to make selections on any of those charts. Again, property of origin, total price received per head and see where they came from. Um, this dashboard came about to pretty much summarize carcass discount. Um, so there was a lot of producers that we're working with that say, oh, we only got a few carcass discounts, five or, cent, five or 10 cents. And once they got it on here and added it up, um, it was quite a surprise to some of them. So again, able to select by dentition as well um, and then break those discount categories down. So where did your meat colour discounts come from? And you'll see the summary change below. 
bruising, scar tissue removal. So obviously some of those things um, you don't have much control over, but the ones that you do, you're able to see if they're coming from all from a certain property or all from a certain breed or what their story might be. Um, I won't go through MSA, but again, obviously the MSA feedback that you get, it's just all on charts. And there is quite a lot of charts here. So people are using what they want and what they don't want. Um, I guess with that, we've seen a lot of producers say, oh, I'll only use certain parts of this. Um, I don't collect much data. And that's completely fine. I guess it shows as much data as what you collect. Um, and then a lot of them are finding that they're able to see certain trends and certain things that they didn't think that they would use. Um, and as they've become more comfortable with using the software, um, they've picked up on other, other things. So um, with this, you're able to actually, sorry, I should go back to carcass. You're able to select your high performing animals and go back to your growing or fertility data and link that in. So, um, and see how those animals performed on property. And we are in the midst of adding um, sire and dam information for those people that are collecting that. So they're able to actually view their highest marbling animals and see what sire or what dam um, that goes back to. And working with a number of the big feedlots to get this feedback back to you. So um, I'm not surprised if some of you will start to see a black box da powered dashboard pop up with um, white label products with some of the bigger feedlots. So it will all be in their branding, but starting to get this feedback back to you. Um, so is there any questions on that? I feel like that's a really quick race through, um, but I should just mention that if anyone's keen to have a more in-depth demo or um, talk about your personal business and how it could work for that, I'm happy to go either to send me a text or an email or if you scan that QR code on the screen, it will allow you to pop your details in and I can send you an email straight through. Um, but yeah, if there's no questions, then. Uh, that's um, fantastic, Edwina, thank you so much. Um, the power in that tool for the industry um, is going to be just incredible. Um, I love how easily you can drill down into information and select information just from the main dashboard. Um, it looks like it's really user-friendly and easy to use, so that's awesome. Um, I haven't had any questions come through yet, but my question would be, how do we actually get that data from the crush um, and from the abs fed back into the system? What's that process? Is that easy? Yep, so it's quite um, quite simple. And I guess a lot of producers say, oh, I'm not collecting a whole lot of data or, um, you know, this is just going to add to the workload. And I guess when you first see it, it can be overwhelming, um, but it's quite simple. So from your Gallagher um, APS or TrueTest Data Mars software, you're able to just drop it into an Excel spreadsheet and you can either upload them individually or we set up a Dropbox for you and you pretty much just drag and drop those CSV files into a Dropbox and it uploads in a matter of a few minutes. Um, so last week I uploaded a client's historical data. I think there was about 250 files. So I was able to just drop those um, spreadsheets into the Dropbox and it was up in a matter of about half an hour. Um, and obviously if there's any if there's any import issues it just pops up and shows you that but we try and make that as seamless as possible um, so that it's easy to get to the system um, and in terms of collecting data fertility it's just a preg test a lactation status um, a date of birth and obviously the sex um, is female but with the date of birth it doesn't actually have to be to that date like if you have a year program we just make it first the first 2021 obviously the more accurate the date of birth the more accurate you can um, drill into the data but in terms of feedlot so that feedback will all be um, working with them and seamlessly back down to the producer the carcass feedback is quite simple because you're able to just drop it in if you're getting feedback um, CSVs drop them into the Dropbox. Have you found that there's a minimum herd size that you need to get use out of this or does it work with smaller herd numbers as well? Have you, have you tried it with smaller herds? So the smallest producer um, we have on is 200 head and then we have quite a few around the 400, 500 um, head amount. Actually, I should say one of the 
one of the users is 50 head. Um, so they work for Black Box and they've just started. Um, so, yeah, so 50 right up to obviously uh, um, hundreds of thousands head. But, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's useful for any size um, producer. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I'd love to keep picking your brains, but I probably should let everyone go in the interest of time. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'll probably give you a call to have a chat just to keep the conversation going because it's really, really intriguing. So I really appreciate you being on today. And thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we have the last of our DigiFarm webinar sessions on Thursday, um, which will be Ag tech from cloud to the paddock. So we've got Danielle and David Statham from Sundown Pastoral Company who will be talking about what they do on the farm. Um, they run a really leading edge cutting business, so that'll be really interesting to listen to what they do and what technology they utilise. Um, that's us finished. We will be putting these presentations up so you can go back and watch or share them if you'd like to. Um, but other than that, thank you to our presenters. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email, email them through to any of us and we'll get you in touch with who you need to speak to to get them answered. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a great afternoon.